Hi, everybody. You would think after a year in the pandemic, I'd be used to all this technology. <laughs> Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining me today, for joining us here at the McCain Institute for the Authors and Insights Book Talk, talk Series, prevented by the McCain Institute for International Leadership. I'm Elise Labatt of Foreign Policy Magazine. In this series, we interview prominent authors of new books on politics, policy, and, and leadership to affirm the importance of character-driven leadership in today's society, which is really by, promoted by uh, John McCain. And today we're joined by a man who epitomizes that, Ambassador Martin Indyk, to talk about his new book, Master of the Game, Henry Kissinger and the Art of Middle East Diplomacy. It's a fascinating look at how America's foremost statesman reshaped American policy, foreign policy for generations to come, and particularly in the Mideast. Martin, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Elise. It's a pleasure to be with you, especially for the McCain Institute. Well, look, I, I mean, let's, let's ask the elephant in the room. I mean, there are no shortage of books about Henry Kissinger, um, and I'm sure you've read all of them. Why did you want to write another one? So this is a book that's uh, different uh, in that all the other books tended to focus on the things that he's most well known for and most controversial for. Uh, the war in Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, uh, the coup in uh, Chile, the detente with the Soviet Union, of course, the opening uh, to China. Um, but in the four years that he was Secretary of State, as opposed to the four years that he was National Security Advisor to Richard Nixon, uh, as Secretary of State, he devoted his efforts to laying the groundwork for an American-led peace process in, the, process in the Middle East. Coming off the 1973 Yom Kippur War, he negotiated a ceasefire, and then two uh, agreements between Israel and Egypt, one between Israel and Syria, which had a lasting impact on the conflict by taking Egypt out of the conflict, using Syria to legitimize that, stabilizing the situation in the Golan and the Sinai, and laying the foundations for the Israel-Egypt peace treaty, which came two years after uh, he left office. And those uh, negotiations and agreements were highly successful and long-lasting and stood in quite stark contrast to the efforts that four presidents made, starting with Bill Clinton and going through to Donald Trump, uh, two of whom I was involved with personally. And um, we failed, to put it bluntly, where Kissinger succeeded. So coming off the third uh, attempt and the third failure, I thought it was time to go back and look where, at where it all began and try to understand how to and how not to make peace in the Middle East according to the Kissingerian way. All right, well, we're gonna to get to the strategy and, and obviously about how it's so relevant today. Um, but I wanna start by talking about the construction um, of the Middle Eastern order uh, that you write about that Kissinger was engaged in. And in particular, um, he pursued the idea of, of a peace, of an you know, Israeli-Palestinian peace or an Arab-Israeli peace with skepticism, which was really at the heart of, of this approach. He wasn't thinking about peace, as you write. He was thinking about preserving order in the Middle East. Yeah, and that, that is, I think, critical distinction. It was not one that was obvious to me going into it, although I thought I knew a lot about the role of the United States in resolving the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, but it became very clear through my uh, reading of all of the negotiations that are preserved in the documents. Uh, that yeah, are you read available. all of those dialogues with the leaders. Exactly. And, and they weren't the kind of dialogues that I expected um, because people like Sadat and, and uh, Rabin in particular, uh, who was prime minister at the time, uh, would argue with Kissinger that they wanted to make peace. And he would say, no, no, that's not worth having. Um, that's not worth the paper it's written on. Uh, you should go for something that's more stable, uh, an arrangement that separates the troops in the first instance, 
that ensures a non-resort to use of force that takes Egypt out of the conflict and therefore makes uh, Arab-Israeli state-to-state conflict essentially impossible. Those are the things that are tangible uh, and peace is intangible. Uh, it's like the Holy Grail. Uh, and, and he, having gone through the Second World War, seen the consequences of appeasement, uh, regarded the pursuit of peace with too much passion uh, and too little skepticism as dangerous. Uh, and, and he especially was wary that American presidents uh, with the immense power of the United States uh, would reach for something that was what he called immortality, universality, uh, the idea of this idealistic notion of peace. Which he Whereas thought he was thought, naive. Very naive. He thought order was far more reliable. And that's what he proceeded to do in the Middle East. Uh, much like uh, he had studied in, in his PhD thesis and his first book, yeah. which was about the order that was established in Europe coming off the Napoleonic Wars by Castle Ray and Metternich. And he took, kind of took that template and applied it to the Middle East. Um, in Europe, it lasted for more or less for 100 years. In the Middle East, it lasted for more or less 30 to 40 years. But for a region of such turmoil, that, that was pretty good. Let, let's start by, by looking at, at Kissinger's background and how he approached Israel, because I think it's really significant here. This is an Orthodox Jew who fled the Nazis with his family. He lost people in the Holocaust. And he, he you write that he wasn't necessarily kind of influenced by it, but it did kind of inform his thinking about Israel. And that diplomatic strategy that you discussed that we'll get um, more in, into the weeds, as we say, um, with it, um, really helped Israel in fundamental ways, even though Nixon was very wary of him because of this softness, if you will, for Israel. Yeah, I, I actually think that, that he's a bit misleading about that. I do think that the chaos in his own life, in his own early life, did inform his his interest and How could it efforts not, really? to promote order, you know, order in his own life and order in the inter in international system was was his motivating force um, for the whole uh, whole of his time, both as an academic and then as a uh, as a, a government official. Uh, but when it came to Israel, uh, you know, as you said, he was an orthodox grew up as an Orthodox Jew. Uh, 13 of his closest family were murdered by the Nazis. Um, and he readily admits there that he had an affinity for Israel. Nixon, appointing him his national security advisor, nevertheless said to him, I don't want you involved with the Middle East. We're going to leave that to Bill Rogers, who was Nixon's secretary of state. Uh, we're going to do everything else. But you need to stay away from the Middle East because of your relationship to Israel, to the Jewish state. And he, uh, Nixon writes in his bi own biography that he didn't want Henry to handle the Middle East because he thought he was too pro-Israel, that he was subject to dual loyalty. And Nixon was basically anti-Semitic and, and viewed Kissinger in that way. This was deeply offensive to Kissinger and he sought ways around it and eventually uh, succeeded in subverting Roger to the, Rogers to the point where Nixon kind of gave up and let him take over the Middle East. It took him about three years to do that. Uh, but even then, Nixon would constantly needle him uh, and, and talk to whoever would listen. I mean, to his own staff, to Al Haig, to uh, Arab foreign ministers, to the Soviet ambassador even, that, that Kissinger was pushing Israel's cause. Um, and, and so that's the way he was viewed in the White House. And it meant that he operated in a, in a way to obfuscate what he was actually up to, um, not only because the environment in the White House was hostile, but because the environment in the State Department was hostile too. And so uh, he made it look like he was one of the good old boys, occasionally said some pretty egregious stuff about Jews in the process. Um, you know, had had his uh, staff while we acquiesced in the wiretapping of his Jewish staff and and his Jewish friends in the press, uh, 
uh, but at the same time, systematically took actions uh, designed to help Israel, to strengthen Israel, and, and to make it a critical part of the order that he was uh, constructing. And I mean, we'll get um, more into, I, I, as we, everybody, I want to just say to the audience, because as we talk to about this, you know, this is what strategy is, right? Like he devised this peace process that was designed to accommodate the political and psychological vulnerabilities um, of Israel that the Yom Kippur, um, Kippur War exposed. He was the original architect with Yitzhak Rabin and then Golda Meir's ambassador Washington of this US strategic alliance, which is really a cornerstone of the strength today, but you know, this is how he preserved the order. He, he sought to remove Egypt, as you said, which was the largest and, and most military powerful force in, Arab, in the Arab world from the contact, sidelined the Soviet Union, um, enlisted kind of Sadat, you know, Assad, King Hussein in this endeavor, and we'll talk about the various uh, players, um, but really this kind of, you know, chessboard um, of, of moves that, that you can see um, really exist in the, in the world order and the Arab, in the Middle East order that we see today. Right, right. And, and I think that in this sense, he was entirely consistent with John McCain's approach um, to the Middle East as well. In fact, he was a great admirer of John McCain. We talk about their relationship, if you like, um, which was a highly emotional one for Kissinger. But Kissinger was the, um, the, the only time that he ever came out and endorsed a candidate other than Rockefeller, who he worked for back in 68, uh, was John McCain. And he worked for the John McCain uh, for president campaign um, because uh, uh, he, he admired him so much. And because of this strategic affinity, they both approached the region in a similar way. And they both saw Israel as a critical player, strategic player in the order that Israel's deterrent strength was critically important to maintaining order uh, in the region. So um, we talked about the, the construct, right? Like, you know, not peace order. Um, but then he thought that that order required a step-by-step -step process. And those of us that follow the Middle East kind of balk at that kind of incrementalism. But he thought this kind of grand deal that, you know, pie in the sky summit or negotiation where you sign on the dotted line and you have peace like a cup of instant noodles was was just, you know, was was not a exactly. not productive, B wasn't possible, and C wasn't the way to achieve the order that he was looking for. Right. Right. I think I think the key here to understand, and it's a, it's a it's a complicated point, is that maintaining order alone didn't work in the Middle East um, because Egypt and and Syria were unsatisfied with an order that left uh, their territory uh, in Israel's hands. Israel had occupied the Golan Heights and and the Sinai Peninsula, all the way up to the Suez Canal in the period uh, after this, as a result of the Six Day War in 1967. And, and they were trying to use force backed by the Soviet Union to regain their territory. And Kissinger was determined to prevent that from happening by building Israel's deterrent strength. But in the end, they launched war to his surprise. And he learned from that very quickly that it was not enough just to have a balance of power, an equilibrium in the balance of power in favor of those powers that would maintain stability. That is, in, in those days, it was the Shah's Iran, Israel, and to an extent, Saudi Arabia, uh, that there had to be a legitimizing process that made the order seem fair, that there was a modicum of justice in the system that made it seem fair for all of the players and gave them a stake in maintaining the order. For that, he needed a peace process. But it was, as you said, a process, not an end game. It was a, process, a legitimizing process for the order in which Israel would give up pieces of Arab territory uh, in an incremental approach, step by step. The, the Arab territory that Israel relinquished 
would be digestible by Israel, both in security terms and in domestic political terms, and would satisfy, would give a modicum of justice to the Arabs and give them a reason for staying, remaining in the peace process and not returning to war. And in the process itself, because it was an American process in which the United States was getting Israel to give up territory to the Arabs as a result of his diplomacy, rather than as a result of their use of Soviet backed force. That's what served to stabilize the order. It was a pretty sophisticated operation. And it's not surprising in a way that the people who came after Kissinger knew not Kissinger, didn't understand this elaborate system that he had created for maintaining order. Jimmy Carter was the first. He, he went off to achieve a comprehensive peace in the pursuit exactly. of Geneva. Exactly. He was, he was looking, and you write, he was looking at the issue of territory for time, to buy time that Israel would give up the territory to maintain the order, um, but it would also right. buy time to exhaust the Arabs, you know, so that eventually um, when Israel did make peace, it was a little bit stronger. It would had, you know, more um, strength security wise, had more American support um, so that it could make the kind of concessions that would make peace. But, but, you know, and I think I, what I love is that this is, book is not, you know, just a kind of celebration of Kissinger to look at some of the shortcomings of this process yes. that, you know, he didn't realize that by strengthening Israel and, and this incremental process, Israel would not, not would grow stronger and dig itself in and entrench itself more in the West Bank so that, you know, what we see today is it's virtually impossible for Israel to give up the West Bank because it's unthinkable now. Right, right. And that was one of the one of the problems that he did not foresee. His process, as you said, was a gradual one that would lead over time eventually to the Arabs coming to accept Israel and being willing to make peace with it. And during that time, Israel would strengthen itself with American support to the point where it could make the concessions, territorial concessions, necessary to achieve the peace. And, but, he, but he saw it as a long process. He, uh, so so one, one part of the problem with the Kissingerian approach was, as you say, it gave Israel time, not time to strengthen itself. That part worked very well, but time to tighten its grip on the West Bank, uh, which was not what Kissinger had in mind at all. The second shortcoming, if I may, Elise, is that, yes. that, that he, as we've discussed, he was very careful not to overreach. He saw this as a problem of American presidents, whether it was promoting democracy or promoting peace. He was very much against overreaching. And the problem with that, and it's evident as I, as I uh, show in the book, is that he was prone to underreach, if there is such a word, I'm not sure, but essentially aiming See too it every low. day, Martin. <laughs> aiming, aiming too low. And at that, as a result of that, he uh, missed the opportunity uh, to prevent the war from breaking out in 1973. Right. Sadat sent him his national security advisor 10 months before the war with a far reaching initiative, a sense of urgency. Kissinger at first was quite excited about it, but when the, the Israelis, Rabin and Golda Meir kind of rejected it, to nothing new here, not serious, he dropped it. And he dropped it because essentially he was cautious and skeptical. Uh, so, you know, arguably he could have headed off that war. In the wake of that war, he, he was much more determined, as we've discussed, to use the peace process, to try to advance peace in his own way. But again, uh, there he had an opportunity to bring Jordan into Jordan. his peace process. He brought Egypt in, he brought Syria in. The king wanted to move. The king wanted to, to a disengagement agreement, which would put him back in, in the West Bank. The Israelis were ready, but Kissinger wouldn't touch it. And as a result, I think he missed an opportunity back in 1974 
to bring Jordan into the West Bank and establish a process that it would have led to the resolution of the Palestinian issue in a Jordanian context, which would have changed the trajectory of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, potentially in quite dramatic, uh, positive ways. But he didn't do that. And he didn't well, do that. Sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Finish. Finish the thought. He didn't do that because he was much more concerned with getting Egypt out of the conflict. And he didn't consider uh, Jordan was, you know, he liked the king, but he didn't consider Jordan was important enough, powerful enough to really make an impact on the order. And the Palestinians, at that time, the PLO was an out and out terrorist organization that had been responsible for the murder of two American diplomats in the Sudan on Kissinger's watch and was seeking to overthrow the King of Jordan and destroy Israel. So from his point of view, the Palestinian issue should be dealt with by Israel and Jordan together. That was their contribution to the status quo, to maintaining order. And it was too low down on the hierarchy, on the ladder of influence to, for, the, for Kissinger to, to take time and, and energy to deal with it. And I think that was a mistake too. Yeah, you, you write that, you know, he paid little attention to the Palestinian issue because he just thought it was, you know, Israel's problem. The, the order itself was was more important. Let's talk about his relationship with some of these leaders. Mm. Um, you've said that, you know, a Sadat was, you know, just so critical to what he was doing and he wouldn't have been able to do it without it. But that a, uh, Sadat was always one step ahead of him and was really kind of he was if if. Uh, you know, Kissinger was was the kind of chess player. Um, uh, Sadat was the master. Yeah. So, so you know, because the McCain Institute is so interested in leadership, I think this is 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 a really good example of of leadership on the part of Anwar Sadat of Egypt. In fact, all all the people that Kissinger was dealing with at that time were kind of giants. Uh, compared to what what uh, Joe yeah. Biden has to deal with in, in the uh, Middle East today. Um, and it's, it's quite extraordinary. I actually had an opportunity to talk to Peggy Noonan about this last night. Um, and she said that were she described as clusters of greatness. I thought that really kind of captured it. These were really big, powerful personalities. Anwar Sadat, Golda Meir, Yitzhak Rabin, uh, Hafez al-Assad in his own way. Um, and they were capable of making big decisions and bringing their people along. But Sadat was in many ways the, you know, the, the one who had the vision of peace, something that Kissinger you know, couldn't quite relate to. Sadat was determined to make peace and he went to war in order to make peace. That was something that Kissinger admired. Before the war, Kissinger viewed him as, as he said, some kind of character out of Verdi's Aida, an opera that was set in Egypt. Uh, he didn't take him seriously. He admits today that, that he thought he was a fool. Uh, and he was encouraged to think so by, by the Israelis as well, who, who thought he wasn't serious until he went to war and surprised them all. And then Kissinger discovered on the first day of the war, that his aims were limited, that he would welcome Kissinger to come to Cairo and launch a, a peace initiative in the midst of the war. So it was quite clear to Kissinger that Sadat had something much bigger in mind. And uh, when he actually had a chance to work with him, he, he learned that Sadat was very determined to move, uh, not at all focused on the details. Um, a, a real visionary and uh, determined and capable of leading his people to peace, which, of course, in the end, after Kissinger had negotiated these two agreements with him, he, he went off to Jerusalem, uh, to the ends of the earth, as he said, to, to make peace uh, under Jimmy Carter. And that produced the peace treaty on a timetable that Kissinger never imagined that, that uh, two years after he left office, there would be an Israel-Egypt peace treaty. He readily admitted to me that that wasn't his plan at all. If he, if Ford had been re-elected and he'd been Secretary of State again, 
He was going to seek a non-belligerency agreement, something short of peace, because again, as we've discussed already, he was he very didn't cautious. Really believe in it, yeah. Um, I want to um, remind everybody we will be taking um, some questions. So if you want to put start putting that in the Q and A, we'll, we will get uh, to your questions. Um, let's talk about Assad. Um, another one who who did who did really want a grander peace than maybe Kissinger was was ready for, and right. that Israel and, was ready for. And and this this was a surprise to me. I I knew Assad and had negotiated with him when I worked for President Clinton as part of his peace team, um, and and so I was quite familiar with his very parsimonious approach to the peace process. He would kind of spoon out his concessions with teaspoons uh, and demand you know, concessions from the other side, from the Israeli side that were totally unreasonable. Uh, but in Kissinger's day, uh, Kissinger beguiled him. Kissinger did a marvelous job of, of kind of educating him to the ways of the world. And, and Assad was, was like a computer in terms of the way that he, he calculated the balance of power, which was Kissinger's way as well. And so they kind of found a, a way to communicate. And, but he was just completely caught up in the tactics of the deal. It's like a bizarre merchant. And, and uh, you know, Kissinger wasn't great at lifting his eyes to the horizon because the horizon for Kissinger was, was a limited one. Um, but, you know, they were worthy uh, sparring partners and Kissinger in the end got the better of him and convinced him to make the deal. But having done that, when he went back to negotiate the second deal with Egypt, which Assad understood would have the effect of ending the Arab-Israeli conflict and leaving Assad high and dry, he had several conversations with Kissinger. Kissinger was smart in that while he was negotiating with Rabin and, and Sadat, he would go to uh, Damascus, even though he was empty handed, uh, and talk to Assad. And Assad at a certain point there said to him, we too are ready for peace. My people are ready for peace. And he put it out in public. He gave an interview to Arnold de Borchgra, the famous Newsweek journalist, uh, in which he said the same thing. And again, kind of Kissinger said, no, 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 we're gonna, we'll deal with that later. We can't possibly achieve the justice that you're looking for. Uh, and so he never really put, put it to Rabin. Here's the irony of the situation. When Rabin became prime minister the second time uh, and came to Washington to meet with President Clinton, their first meeting, what did Rabin do? He offered full withdrawal from the Golan Heights in order to make peace with Syria. So if Kissinger had tested it back then, he would have, I believe he would have found Rabin willing as well. Um, and that he could have uh, potentially made a peace between Israel and Syria. As, as much as that sounds fanciful today, when we see uh, the brutality that Hafez al-Assad's son uh, has, has imposed on his own people through the Syrian civil war, Nevertheless, in those days, it was it was a very different zeitgeist and a different environment. And and uh, you know, I asked Kissinger in my last. I did about twelve interviews with him. My last interview with him, I, I said to him, "Did you ever regret not going for for the bigger deal, not going for the peace?" You know, the fact is, Jimmy Carter made peace between Israel and Egypt two years after you left office. Uh, on the on the back of your all of your hard work, and he said, "I'm happy it happened." He said, "But I'm I I don't regret it." He said, "Because I always feared that if I pushed it too hard, I would break it. It being the peace process." Yeah, the pot, and, the, the Colin Powell pottery barn rule. Yeah, except he was talking about peace, not about war. Right, right. Uh, that I would break it. And it was for me, it was one of those kind of light bulb moments. Wow. I thought, yeah, you know, that's what we did. That's <laughs> exactly. what we did at Camp David <laughs> right. too. Right. When, right. when under Ehud Barak, the Prime Minister of Israel's urgings, Clinton slept Arafat 
to Camp David. Arafat did not want to go. As Kissinger would have said, he wasn't ready to make peace with Israel. But, but we took him there um, in order to try to achieve an end of conflict deal. And we pushed hard and we broke it. And the result was the Intifada, which raged for five years, killed thousands of people on both sides and destroyed the entire edifice of peace that we'd worked eight years to build in the Clinton administration. And it has been impossible to put Humpty Dumpty back together again since then. Right. Um, I, I want to get to um, you know subsequent efforts, but just to kind of sew up the the Syria piece. I mean, even though um, he didn't get that grand piece, when you look at these kind of painstaking agreements he negotiated uh, between Israel and Syria um, on the Golan, you know that's held. Yeah. You know, obviously, kind exactly. of Iran poking the bear and everything has has been a problem, but these these agreements he negotiated between Syria and Israel and, and Egypt and Israel, you know, ha, did, you know, held between Egypt until they made peace and and with Syria largely have held now. And, it, and indeed, you know, the Syria one was a bit of a surprise, I think, to, to Kissinger as well. In the middle of the negotiations, Assad said, if the Israelis agree to this deal, they, they can have a long period by which he meant a long period of calm. Even though Assad was only regaining a portion of the Golan Heights, he was willing to basically be done for a while. And he really never went back to threatening war with Israel, uh, let alone taking war with Israel. And he kept the Golan Heights quiet for 40 years, right? I mean, right up until now, as you said, with the a few issues because the Iranians are trying to push their their militias up into the Golan Heights, and the Israelis are now bombing Iranian positions there, and not in the Golan, but nearby. But um, nevertheless, the Golan has stayed a quiet domain. It's not a place where the Syrians or Palestinians or any anybody else is coming across the border, and that was that was you know the genius of of Kissinger, that he managed to work out an interim agreement. That's what it's called, an interim agreement that nevertheless held for a very long time. Um, okay, so we, we know that, you know, since Kissinger's time, the U.S. leaders have fallen into the same trap that, you know, um, he, was, he was fearing um, was that they were trying to make peace this grand peace with the summit and negotiation. And as a result, you say there's there's no peace anymore and there's no real prospect of one right now. All right. Now, that's true between Israel and the Palestinians. But the Israel-Egypt peace treaty held. The peace process in, in the end produced an Israel-Jordan peace treaty and the Oslo Accords between the Israelis and the Palestinians. By the way, just as an aside, uh, the Oslo Accords are pure Kissingerian doctrine. Um, and it was a surprise to me to understand that because Rabin had opposed what Kissinger was trying to sell him when he was prime minister the first time. They ended up having a huge fight about it. Kissinger declared a reassessment in the relationship between the United States and Israel back in 1975. But in the end, he so convinced Rabin that when Rabin came to deal with the Palestinian issue, as Israel's problem, as Kissinger had suggested, he introduced a step-by-step -step process. The Oslo Accords was a three-phase step-by-step process of Israeli withdrawal from Gaza and the West Bank with no agreed end game, no specification of what the end game would be. There's no Palestinian state in the Oslo Accords. There's no Jerusalem. There's no refugees. And there's no sacred dates, as Rabin kept on saying. It was an evolutionary process that was designed to take time. And so, you know, it, it, the, the Kissinger's impact manifested itself in, in that way. But again, as I said before, we didn't have enough respect for that uh, gradual incremental process. So Barack comes along and says to Clinton, let's finish it in your last year, my first year, and Clinton says, okay, we'll go and do that. 
He should have said, and I take this on my own shoulders as well as all the other of his advisors, we should have said to him, don't do this. Stick with the phase by phase incremental approach because the Palestinians aren't ready to make peace, aren't ready for the final deal. But we didn't do it. Right. And, and then and then you say that, you know, all these efforts destroy the order that he created and then make, you know, damage U.S. credibility, make peace, you know, even more possible. But we have seen this kind of return to if you see what we're doing now, you know, in the, which now by default is this Kissingerian model in the sense that we have we do have small incremental steps, the kind of peace pro I don't want to call it a process because there's no real pro I mean, we'll talk about the Abraham cards in a minute, but yes. the precisely the one thing he had in mind in the current environment would be small, you know, steps most, you know, in, in the current um, environment, yes. mostly economic. Um, right. But we do see like when we then we look at the Abraham Accords, um, you know, it's exactly what Kissinger had said, the Emiratis who are you know, led the process that said they decided to normalize with Israel because they're exhausted of the concept. Right, exactly right. So, so you've got two things going on here at the same time, and they're both Kissingerian. Uh, the first is the Abraham Accords, as you say, in which the Arab states who are not actually at war with Israel, but, you know, the Arab state-to-state Arab-Israeli conflict was kind of uh, finished in Kissinger's day. He took Egypt out of the conflict and the other Arabs then couldn't consider going back to war because of Egypt's uh, strength, military power, standing and so on. Without Egypt, they couldn't contemplate uh, going to war with Israel. So that created a, a kind of runway, a very long runway for the other Arab states to come to terms with Israel. And it's been a process with them as well. It started in 1993 that the Oslo Accords enabled some of them to start to engage with Israel. It got broken off by the Intifada, but with the threat from Iran creating a common interest between Israel and the Sunni Arab states, they picked, picked up the pace again. And, and as we see, the breakthrough to the Abraham Accords, the Emiratis, the Bahrainis, the Moroccans, and uh, to some extent the Sudanese, normalized uh, their relations with Israel, just as Kissinger and you said, you know, they became exhausted by the conflict. They decided it was time to get on with their, their lives and then pursue their interests. And Israel was an important part of that. So that was one thing. On the other hand, <clears throat> the peace process was run into the ground as we discussed and the various efforts to resurrect it, excuse me, the various efforts to resurrect it failed. And so we're left now with a situation in which the government of Israel is comprised of a left-right coalition that fundamentally disagrees amongst themselves about what the outcome should be when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. One side wants a Palestinian state, the other side opposes it and wants to annex the West Bank. Uh, the Palestinians similarly a split between the Palestinian Authority and the West Bank, uh, Hamas in Gaza. Hamas wants to destroy Israel. The Palestinian Authority wants to make peace with Israel, but you know they can't agree either. So you can't get there from here. As much as American presidents might want to kind of wave the magic wand again, as Donald Trump did, and come up with a plan and figure that you know somehow everybody was going to accept it. Uh, you can't get there from here. And Joe Biden understands that. So um, we, by default, we have to go back to yeah. an incremental process. Do you think that's the core lesson? One of the questions um, Amy Grappone is asking, do you, do you, what are the core lessons that President Biden and future presidents can take from Kissinger's experience and successes? I would say that you're saying that it, it can't be like a slam dunk. Right. Um, right. It needs to be a, an incremental um Exactly. And, but there, there, there's, I mean, I think that's absolutely true in terms of the peace process. Uh, and, and that's the only process that, that can work now, but we should, we should embrace it. We shouldn't just say, okay, you, 
Israel, go off and do your economic steps and, and hopefully that'll calm things down. We've got other more important issues to deal with. We should, we should be supporting it and, and moving it forward and adding, getting the Israelis to add a territorial component. Because remember, that, that was critical to Kissinger's uh, notion of a peace process that legitimized the order. There needs to be a territorial component. The Israeli government started with, with offering the Palestinians to build in Area C, which is the 60% of the West Bank that Israel completely controls, and offering them some, I think it was 1,900 permits for building. That's, a, that's an important op opening. We need to exploit that opening and to make, make the steps territorial as well as economic and create a political horizon for the Israelis and the Palestinians. Of course, these Palestinians have to reciprocate this giving up the incitement, giving up the support for terrorism, uh, et cetera. But you know, that, is, that is a way forward in which I think the administration needs to lean in a bit more than it's doing at the moment. Um, but but you know, in, in terms of the wider context, we've got a situation now that was familiar to Kissinger because when he engaged in the Middle East, it was coming off the back of a withdrawal from Vietnam. And he didn't have force to back his diplomacy. Uh, and so he had to rely on relentless diplomacy, exactly the words that Joe Biden uses now. He wanted to see relentless, 30 days on the road for an Israel-Syria disengagement agreement, 13 trips to Damascus and Jerusalem, back and forth he went. That's relentless. Uh, but I would say you know, that John Kerry um, and you were you were along for the ride, um, involved very heavily um, he was as an envoy. No he was relentless. That but, that was relentless he, diplomacy in action. Maybe not in you know he didn't call it that, but it was painstaking diplomacy. It was indeed, but it was for for an objective that we couldn't achieve. Right, right. To say an end of conflict yes. negotiation, which we had. Yeah. But, yeah. but I was you know, overseeing that negotiation and the parties were further apart at the end of the process than they were at the beginning. Yeah. Um, um, in your view, um, question from the audience, in your view, did Kissinger have a proclivity towards dealing with autocrats over elected leaders? You know, uh, I don't think that's fair. Uh, he dealt the, with the hand. He, he, he dealt with the leaders that he that he had in front of him. Uh, he did not believe, being a realist and and a uh, kind of Westphalian man, did not believe in interfering in the you know internal affairs of of these states. And certainly, dealing with Assad and Sadat was easier because they were autocrats who could make decisions. Dealing with the Israelis was hard work because he was constantly facing the challenge of, of getting the cabinet to support the leaders. This is coalition, always coalition governments in Israel because of the political system. And uh, a public that was deeply skeptical of the whole process and, and ended up being deeply skeptical of Henry Kissinger too. Um, so it was, it was much more difficult, but he didn't resolve from it. I mean, he didn't uh, uh, say, um, you know, I can't deal with this. He worked it. He worked it. He complained, he said Israel doesn't have a foreign policy, it only has domestic politics. But, um, but he, he worked on it and he worked with them and he convinced them. And it's, uh, you know, I, I detail this in the book um, because I think it's so fascinating as somebody who's had to deal with Israeli leaders, how he managed to convince them with his arguments, as we discussed much earlier. And his arguments were kind of, at, at, attacked the the issue in a way that he ended up convincing them that that they should trade territory for time that buying time was critical to Israel's survival and well-being and and he turned out to be right in that regard. What was the most surprising thing someone in the audience is asking? So the most surprising thing that you um, uncovered while researching the book? Well, I think I, I I did point to that already, which was that I thought that I was writing a book about the peace process, about where it all began. <laughs> uh, Henry Kissinger was- The whole construct peace. is the surprise. That's right. And I discovered right. that he was, just, he was uh, pursuing order instead. But there's a, there was, for me, 
a real lesson in that. And, and it's not obvious, you know, if you read his memoir, it's not obvious. Uh, it was only obvious as a result of studying the dialogue, the negotiations, what he was saying in those negotiations. And it wasn't obvious because I said he, he had to obfuscate this. He had to convince everybody who was actually seeking peace. But, but uh, and, and that's why people who came after him, including me, didn't understand the basic precepts of his peace process. And that's what I've, in the end, tried to do in this book is make people understand that the art of Middle East diplomacy is not just about seeking peace, certainly that, but it's also about the need to pay attention to maintaining and building a stable order. Um, well, I mean, that th here's a question that you and I have talked about. Like, when you look at this strategy and you look at his, his mastery of, of kind of seeing all the, the different pieces, and as you point out, he did have some blind spots. Um, and then you look at some of the Middle Eastern leaders today and, you know, and you look at, you know, previous um, administrations, how we're always going back to the Kissingers or the Scowcrofts or the Brzezinski's when we talk about the big thinkers or the strategic thinkers. I would argue we have very few and, and there are some and, and I will they'll remain nameless to avoid offending anybody, but I just feel that we that that strategic thinking is not really a prerequisite for career advancement. And we don't we don't have those those people that kind of see all the larger pieces and, and are developing those kind of strategies. Why? Yeah. I, well, I have a theory about it. Um, that Kissinger and Brzezinski in particular uh, were Europeans who kind of came out of uh, a European situation, which was a strategic, a highly strategic environment, in the midst of the Cold War, the, you know, the, the battle raging between East and West in Europe was highly strategic. So they had to think strategically. Uh, you know, I come from Australia, that's the accent, in case you didn't notice. Um, and Australia lives in a strategic environment, you know, surrounded by Asian powers and, and out there isolated as a kind of Western outpost. So Australians tend to think strategically um, because their survival depends on it. Singapore is another example. Uh, and so, you know, but the United States is a you know, superpower. It doesn't have to worry about the nations on its borders. Canada and Mexico aren't going to go back to war with it. Um, and, and it's got oceans separating it from these troubled regions around the world. Um, and so it's, it's unnecessary for Americans to really think strategically, uh, and except when we go into a geopolitical environment. And that's what we're going back into now, where we're, you know, now engaged in geopolitical competition with China and uh, Russia. And that's when we have to start to think again in a strategic way. We're forced to do that. And so I think it will be a, a product of the, of the times. And it'll be interesting to see the Biden administration is about to come out with its uh, strategic review. That, you know, it'll be interesting to see how they manage this geopolitical challenge and what strategy they put forward for dealing with it. By the way, John McCain was a strategic thinker. He was. Um, well, on that note, um, you have um, um, uh, Garrett Mitchell asking a question. When you examine the Middle East kind of Rushmore, Mount Rushmore lineup, um, there's really no Palestinian leader. Um, what does that say? What does that tell us? Was Abba Iban right? And is there a chance that there's a Palestinian Sadat or Rabin somewhere in the offing? Look, it's always possible, but but um, there's a reason that we get so frustrated with the lack of Palestinian uh, leadership, and it's that that um, they they don't have a state of their own, they don't have state institutions, they don't have the ability to to make commitments and keep to them in the way that states 
do, including the Arab states around Israel. Um, and, and there was one leader, Palestinian leader, who was devoted to building Palestinian institutions brick by brick. His name was Salam Fayyad. Uh, and he did a yes. great job. And we loved him for that. Uh, he was the darling of American policymakers, but he had no legitimacy at home. He had no real base uh, amongst the Palestinians. The Palestinians who had support were those who engaged in the armed struggle, as they called it, um, against Israel. And Arafat was was the one who, you know, epitomized that struggle. And he therefore had leadership. He was the one who could make the compromises, um, but he wasn't willing to do so. At least he wasn't willing to do so on our timetable. And Abu Mazen came after him, a man committed to peace, a man opposed to terrorism, but then didn't have the legitimizing means to, to basically have his people follow him. He's in the 12th year of his four-year term as president, and he doesn't have legitimacy amongst his own people. And therefore, he's not willing to compromise because he fears that if he does so, he, he'll be overthrown by his people. Uh, so it's a, it is a, a real problem. And it's why I say that it would have been potentially very different if um, Kissinger had brought Jordan into uh, the process working with the Palestinians. And to this day, you know, it would be good for Jordan to take up more of a role uh, with the Palestinians because it would provide the kind of uh, state institutions that can fulfill, help, help the Palestinians fulfill their commitments. Um, tease that out for me because I know during, I would say during the, um... Trump administration, I feel Jordan was a little bit sidelined because they didn't necessarily de um, accept the Trump administration's construct. But like, what would a Jordan, what would a Jordan involvement in, in kind of, uh, I guess, not a guarantor, but, a um, you know, a partner in the peace process mean? Right. So, so it's actually not just Jordan, it's Jordan in the West Bank, it's Egypt and Gaza. Um, for geographic reasons. And Egypt today is moving into Gaza in a way that it hasn't for a very long time. It's got a presence there. It's working hard to do a long-term ceasefire between Hamas and the government of Israel and a prisoner exchange and, and leaning on Hamas to uh, ensure that, that it's going to uh, avoid a resort to rocket fire in exchange for an opening of Gaza, uh, in exchange for some 30,000 Palestinians coming into the West, into Israel from Gaza to work. These kinds of things that can create, guess what, a stable order in which Egypt is, is uh, the, the custodian of the commitments and makes sure that Hamas lives up to it. So that's a similar role that, that Jordan could play. Jordan's a lot more skittish about it because Unlike Egypt, it's a small country. And as you know, Elise, it has a, a Palestinian majority population on the East Bank. Um, so it's going to. Well, and, and Israel Bank. wants to annex the Jordan Valley. I mean, it's right. not as if, it's not as if like Israel sees them as just like a, um, you know, a, yeah. an added value. It's they want to take something from Jordan. Yeah. So, so that is, that is a kind of complicating factor, I agree. But it's it's all the more reason to get them involved and to give Israel a stake in Jordan's uh, uh, survival because it's helping not just vis-a-vis -vis the East as it does, um, protecting kind of Israel's border from the East, but also helping in the West, in the West Bank. And, and I think, you know, if you had a Kissingerian, a full Kissingerian approach, he says that the way to handle the Palestinians now is to treat them as a state in the making, quote unquote. And well, that's what Salam Fayyad tried to do, to right. act like a state exactly. in the making. 
right, and allow them attributes of sovereignty and even recognize them as a state with undefined borders. And in that context, have Jordan and the Palestinians federate, federation of two states in which Jordan would then have the cover to play a more active role in the West Bank with Palestinian acquiescence, much as the Palestinians in Gaza now acquiesce with Egypt's increased role uh, there. Do we have a, a, I mean, here's a question from Luke Engelbert, and then I want to close it on one last question on Kissinger. Um, with you saying that Kissinger laid the foundation for peace in the Middle East, is peace becoming possible even with the lack of a Kissinger figure in U.S. foreign policy? And, and it sounds like something you're describing, like a federation with Jordan. We would need a real Kissingerian figure to to be able to um, see that see that in its uh, to, yeah. to imagine um, that. Look, Kissinger was highly sophisticated, and and uh, because of the environment he was operating in, he you know he was the master of obf obfuscation as well as the master of the diplomatic game. But it does you know it's not that complicated. It starts with a balance of power, an equilibrium in the balance of power. That's something, by the way, that, that the Biden administration does need to pay attention to because it is shifting its focus to China and Asia and moving resources away from the Middle East to China and Asia to deal with China's military rise. It needs to pay attention to the balance of power in the Middle East because if it, in the process, leaves a vacuum that others will fill like Russia, Turkey, China, even. Uh, that could become quite, and oh, thank you, Iran in particular. Um, that can become quite unstable. So we need to pay attention to stabilizing the balance of power. That's the fundamental Kissingerian principle. Well, uh, aren't, the, means... aren't the Gulf states kind of creating a new order amongst themselves with Israel, mm -hmm. cutting out the Palestinians, kind of cutting out the Jordanians? Um, Not to this Jordan. lack Jordan of attention, of this right. lack of attention is almost creating a new order in itself. In, in, in a sense, yes, but it's not. It's not total lack of attention. I think the administration is is aware of it, is focused on it. They're they're kind of spending quite a bit of time uh, working the Israelis and the Sunni Arabs, the Gulf Arabs, as you suggest. I just think they, you know, that that's the first principle. We need to stabilize an order in which the United States is supporting um, our allies and partners in the region rather than dominating the whole region. So, but then it, it, you know, it's a matter of how do you deal with Iran? And Kissinger is quite clear about that, um, that they need to be deterred and they need to be contained until they decide to be a country rather than a cause, give up the revolution and become a state engage in state-based behavior again. And when they do that, Kissinger's view is very clear that we should engage with them and we should, should shift to a kind of offshore balancing position between all of the powers in, in the region, including Iran. But something has to change in Iran first. And from his point of view, that could take many years, if not decades. Uh, and then we need, as I already suggested, Kissingerian approach to the peace processes, you know, more or less there in terms of the incrementalism that's now being introduced. We just need to get behind it and, and, and uh, give it more momentum, bring Egypt in, bring Jordan in. Um, so the basic outlines are there. And I hope that um, my book can make a contribution in that sense to getting policymakers to understand the way in which uh, they too can adopt uh, a Kissingerian, an updated Kissingerian approach that can help maintain the order and recreate a peace process that will lead eventually to uh, Israeli-Palestinian peace. Um, I'm going to close on one last question from our friend Charlie Wolfson. Um, I think it's Charlie. It says Charles, but um, I think it's him. Um, and I'm going to branch it out a little. You were dealing with a man in his 90s. Um, how forthcoming was Kissinger in the conversation and what areas did he hold back? Um, or was he less forthcoming? Talk to us. 
as we close, um, just about this process, you said 12 interviews with this man who's continually learning and writing. He's doing all this stuff with AI. I mean, just to sit down with him 12 times. Um, talk to us about that. Well, he's 98 years old, um, but his mind uh, is working a, like a 60 year old. Um, he remembers a lot of what happened. Uh, the things that he doesn't remember, but I gotta remember what happened five years ago, let alone 50 years ago. And, and he is um, still very clear about his approach and, and uh, therefore, you know, we were able to have a, a good conversation about all of this. He didn't like what I wrote in the book, at least not at first. Um, he didn't appreciate the criticism. Uh, he's pretty sensitive about those things. Who wouldn't be at 98? But, but on the other hand, I think he came to understand that um, that the uh, study of his tactics and strategy uh, in the Middle East was something that hadn't been done before and was actually to the benefit of his reputation. Um, Martin, this was, we could go on for another hour, but this was really great. Um, Master of the Game, a wonderful book. I encourage everybody um, to read it. And, and thank you so much for taking the time. I'd like to thank the McCain Institute um, and thank you to the audience for tuning in. Thanks, Elise. Thank you all. Appreciate it very much.